welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, and we are a not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Nectarius Karanikas. He is an Associate Professor of Health, Safety and Environment at the Queensland University of Technology. He also served in the Hellenic Air Force for 18 years as an aeronautical engineer, where he served in various positions related to maintenance and quality management and accident prevention and investigations. Dr. Kranikas has also published numerous academic journal articles and in 2016 launched the International Cross Industry Safety Conference and helped develop courses in the area of safety and risk management and safety investigations. Welcome, Nectarius. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Great introduction. Nice <laughs> to be with so you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so what prompted you to change from an, an engineering focus to be more focused on work safety? That's a great question. I will admit it was more a matter of chance rather than very intentional, which I don't regret at all because the engineering mindset is very deductive. You know, you have systems and you try to solve problems and design better products by Mm -hmm. decomposing, finding faulty things, you know, replacing them or repairing them and then putting things together and test. So when I was back in the Air Force, I was trying to do a master's and Air Force had some sponsorships there. So the first year I applied for the sponsorship, it was a very technical topic, turbine technology. Okay, yeah. And I was not selected. And the next year, there was a master's in human factors and safety. I had already attended a course about safety prevention and safety investigations. So I was quite familiar. But this human factors thing really appealed to me. So I applied, I was successful. And from this point on, actually, I became more inclusive. I still try to combine the engineering part with the social part in my research, teaching okay. and, and, and practice. It was a great experience, not just the studies themselves, but what I could do with the skills and knowledge I gained to contribute to a healthier and safer workplace. So yes, uh, that was a real a uh, really big change, not just okay. my career, but the way I approach the world. Right. So it was more of a fundamental change in how you sort of yes. thought about things. That's really interesting. So in your experience, obviously you've, you've dealt a lot with, you know, unsafe workplaces. What are some of the biggest contributing factors that you've seen? Hazards change in nature as technology evolves. Mm -hmm. as the environment changes. And the problem is that until we manage one, two, three risks, new ones emerge or new combinations come into place. So sometimes it feels like we're lagging behind, you know, developments in the industry. And the big problem is that because health and safety are immaterial constructs, you look at me and say, okay, he must be a healthy guy, but am I really healthy? Yeah, so I mean, same with safety. I mean, it looks <laughs> safe, but is it safe? Yeah. So because safety and health are things you cannot touch, you cannot observe, mm-hmm. they become a second priority for businesses. Yeah. So in the for the sake of development and economic growth and other initiatives, the the businesses not they don't care about safety is that they don't really give it the gravity it deserves. So that's one thing. And then whether they push the envelope of operations to a specific direction, let's do that, let's expand here, uh, let's put new processes, let's deliver new services, let's design new products. Unfortunately, in 2022, health safety become a, have, a, have a say only at the end. Like we made yeah. the decision, do we have now any risks to control? But Sometimes this is too late. And I suppose it's going to be a matter of perspective as well. Like what is healthy? What is healthy enough? What is safe enough? Like you, you, it's something that, you know, you can say there are so many, you know, accidents that happen in this workplace. And I suppose 
you've got to somewhat arbitrarily decide this number is acceptable. Um, yeah, who's <laughs> to say that? And yeah. Is, now the pandemic, I mean, we live in the pandemic still. Mm -hmm. So now how many deaths are acceptable? When are we going to switch from pandemic to endemic? Yeah. Who, who would ever say a number? Of course, morally speaking, zero deaths is what we should pursue. But now, practically and logically speaking, you cannot prevent everything. But yeah. you need to put any effort to minimize the risks. I do remember our Queensland health officer, she was asked how many deaths were acceptable. And her answer was that she's a doctor and that from her perspective, no preventable deaths are acceptable. You know, if it can be prevented, can prevent it should it, be. Yeah. That's true. Now, of course, prevention requires knowledge and awareness yeah. and monitoring. So it's easy to say we should prevent things, but not always feasible. I will give you an example. A couple of years ago, which has to do with the sustainability, we looked with my students about wind farms. So wind energy is you know, green energy and contributes to environmental sustainability. So we have great developments there size of installations, you know, many turbines and so on. And we looked, okay, did ever anyone search research about the health and safety risks about those people who work to manufacture, mm -hmm. to install, to maintain, and then disassemble maybe at the end of the life, you know, this, um, the turbines. And whether regarding safety, we find quite good controls because the safety risks are more or less common with other industries. When it comes to occupational health, there was astonishingly lack of research and studies, and not from academia alone, but also from governments, you know, industry agencies and so on. So it's what I said before, let's do it. Let's go. Yeah. Sustainability and, uh, to help and to save the environment because we are part of the environment. We need to, to thrive and secure a future for everyone. But you see that those developments sometimes, because we push the envelope there to, to speed up the process, do not consider yeah. that we might kill people. It's got to be an interconnected solution. It can't just be focusing on just the environment, <laughs> just safety. That's sort of where the UN Sustainability Development Goals originated, is, is trying to manage all of these multiple factors that contribute to, you know, the world and, and our well-being as a species. So we need to be, you know, finding answers that are meeting those goals. And so, yeah, that means that when you are installing something that's for renewable health, you need to make sure that it's not going to be damaging the people who are installing it. It's not going to be negatively impacting the wildlife in the area as well. Because I've, I've seen like some places you put in, you know, a wind turbine, for example, if it's in a peat or a boglands type area, it's just that native habitat is just not suitable for that and, and it can be quite destructive so yeah it is very much a holistic I think take that you need to it is <laughs> easier to say than done um yes. that's true but you know if we keep this in mind what we call in health and safety a systems approach systems thinking Mm -hmm. like we are part of smaller and bigger systems and all of us as elements of those systems and everything around interacts with us and we shape it we interact with it so of course we cannot have a very detailed view of a huge system that's why we need to come together different experts from different areas yep. who know the system from a specific you know perspective yeah and then say okay what do you think how will we decide what can damage your area and what can benefit and to find this balance, I think businesses have misunderstood the sustainability as the ultimate perfection of how we use the energy and the resources we have to better our lives yeah. now and in the future. Yes, but we, we must be mindful. Um, we did another review with aviation fuels. So we have now alternative aviation fuels, which okay. are far more environmental friendly and uh, they are in production. And then we check. Great. Is this an opportunity also to minimize the health risks for people who are exposed to fuel? 
because indeed, uh, you know, fuels from oil are quite toxic, very dangerous. And we didn't find actually any compelling evidence that those new types of fuels in aviation are healthier for uh, workers. So we have a missed opportunity here yeah. because we focused only on the environment, the emissions, the production, the quality, the performance of aircraft. And where's the worker? Yeah, it, it's about optimize. It's, it's what you're choosing to optimize for, I suppose. Yeah. And, you know, you, you neglect other aspects. And that's, yeah, yeah, that's why we say you cannot optimize everything at once. You need yeah. to balance. You need to compromise. Absolutely. So now I've, I've also, I think everyone might, might have heard the saying that regulations are written in blood. Why do you think that that's the case? Oh, interesting. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, research shows that we humans learn mainly from failures. So this follows and matches all contexts. So you see, we have already a climate crisis mm -hmm. and then we started. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. it had to reach that the, point the, the, before the, the, we the, even the, took it seriously. Yeah. yeah, but we do that during our daily activities sometimes. We push the boundaries of our systems continually. Mm -hmm. You drive, okay? You observe the speed limit when you're 18, 19, 20, <laughs> and then say, hey, I can do it a bit faster, a bit more yeah. dangerously, up to the point that the system breaks down and you're exposed, injured, you know, or even dead. And then, ah, I should have done differently. So we have many initiatives in health and safety and management in general that say, okay, guys, we cannot just wait for the failure to happen to change. Yeah, so you to, need to, to anticipate look. what's going to happen. Yeah, we need to find those weak signals, this variability in the systems that indicates that something is coming. Mm -hmm. And we don't yet have this proactive approach. We talk very much about it in theory. Mm -hmm. We must be proactive. We must be proactive. Still, we are very reactive. Do you think that the part of the reason we are reactive rather than proactive is that if you've prevented something from happening, you can't really prove that you stopped it from happening? Yes, that's true. And that's a point where occupational health and safety struggles when we want to, to launch in initiatives to prevent, say, how many injuries did you prevent? Well, you will never know. Yeah, Yeah, you can't know. It's it's... it's it's like you ask somebody how many years of life you gain by quitting smoking. We have indications that it's harmful, but that's not a nice argument. Otherwise, um, everything would be hopeless. We should stop thinking, theorizing, uh, improving systems or whatever, and just wait there to see a catastrophe. Say, okay, we have a disaster. Now we need to act. Yeah, yeah. We need to make sure that we're taking appropriate precautions, I suppose you could say. I mean, the whole life is an experiment. Mm -hmm. You drive. Is it 100% you will arrive? No, I mean, there's a In certain level piece. of risk we, we accept. <laughs> yes. We go, yeah. And that's why, based on past knowledge, you try to, let's say, minimize the risks, the exposure yes. to, to, to bad things. Now, as I said before, though, As we introduce new things in our systems, we change like the aviation fuels, I said before, okay? We have new energy sources. Since we have the knowledge that system changes, if not managed appropri you know, appropriately, they will probably at some point lead to a death or injuries or whatever. Why should we wait to yeah. check, okay, do we introduce additional risks? I suppose we just got to like, go with the best information that we have and, and yep. make the best choices that we possibly can. Yep. Have you heard much about um, the recent issues with Amazon, such as like the warehouse disaster, where, you know, they had the storm and, and people weren't allowed to leave. Do you have any thoughts on, on that sort of disregard for employee well-being? This is more a decision that does not exactly fall under health and safety but of course everything you can label everything health and safety yeah in, in okay. some respects yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah nevertheless you see that the decision was not driven by a care a duty of care for the employees it was driven by productivity care yeah the dangerous thing is to rush to conclusions 
without doing a proper inquiry there with the people who made the decision. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to, to blame workers for the mistakes and errors, but I think we should be fair also towards management right. and understand really what drove them to, to make such a decision. I'm sure if you ask them now retrospectively, they didn't want to kill people. Well, did they? Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, yeah, we have a crime here. We don't have a health and safety. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the intention. Now, what made them ignore? or underestimate some parameters? Did they know about the structural strength? Yeah. Did, if they didn't know, did they ask for this information while waiting for the you know, weather effect? Uh, it's easy to say, to, to, to blame people directly. Ah, they enforced people to stay there. They didn't allow them to leave. Yes, that's not a good thing in hindsight. But we need to employ foresight so to, to go there and the, understand the decision making. And to me, Rebecca, it's not very surprising. We just finished a project with a student here at QQT. We haven't finalized it, but we looked whether the business and management degrees at universities, which prepare the leaders of tomorrow, mm -hmm. how, as we said before, to, to bring everything together and health and safety. Right. And do they? What do you think? What is your I'm, guess? I'm going to guess no, that they don't. To a large extent, it's a no. That's, that's really disappointing. Like that, so that's... how do we expect the future leader that the, the only thing we teach those leaders is about how to make money, how to market the service, how to avoid quality defects, how to keep the customers happy, how to read the balance, you know, financial uh, sheets or whatever. And yep. then there's health and safety, which is one of the most regulated and standardized areas yeah and yep. they have no clue during the studies <laughs> it's a huge oversight isn't it like that they're not being trained in something that should be quite integral to how they go about their work yeah. and i asked a colleague who is in the business school because i know that she's uh quite close to health and safety mm -hmm. and i asked her what do you do in your business school say i'm delivering in a three years bachelor degree now one or two lectures okay well, something is better than nothing, but imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not very much, is it? No, no. And this happened because she is safety or health minded, not because it's structurally embedded in the course. Right. If she leaves, you know, the university, this, those lectures will live with them, with, right. with her, sorry. So yeah. it's not even part of the, no, you it's know. Not... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's guest lecturing, you know, something like that. I suppose that shows that the impact an individual can have as well, you know, like when one person goes, hey, I care about this, so I'm going to like integrate it into what I'm teaching people. We can make a bigger ongoing impact just by, you know, sharing information and perspectives. That's commendable. We should do that. But at some point it needs to be structured. Yes, yes, we to need that infrastructure. Part, yeah, yeah to, be, to be there. So if Rebecca leaves, what Rebecca has been doing must remain here yeah. for us to, to use, to, to consult, to, 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 you know, to use this information. That's a big challenge. And then we say we lack a systems approach, this holistic approach, as you said before. Of course, because we're not educated for a systems approach. And yeah. in environment, sustainability. If you read research about safety and sustainability, I don't want to be absolute, but most of the studies we have are about how health and safety contributes to business sustainability. Yeah, of course. It's yeah. only this system. Now, how this affects the environment? So they don't actually assess the risk to the environment or consider no. the health and safety? That's... A big problem isn't it and also do they consider how like things like climate change impact work safety as well we started looking at that that's true especially when we have people various industry sectors outdoor workers with you know yeah. climate change heat uh vulnerabilities we have people who were died from um, diseases zoonotic diseases you know born yep. by insects or animals biological hazards. And the with, pandemic is an example yes, of the... Yes. Imagine how the workers who are amidst this uh, recovery from flooding here in South East yeah. Queensland. Oh, yes, I would like to pump out the water from the building as soon as possible, but I don't want somebody to die in three, four, five years due to a disease 
that yep. he or she contracted during this process. So that that's sort of another thing, like, you know, you have to take that care when you're doing things. Do you think that like the regulations from an infrastructural point of view are, are necessary or do you think people can be trusted to do things for themselves or assess their own risks? We need the regulations and legislation, but we cannot prescribe life. Okay. No regulation or code of practice can anticipate all eventualities and combinations of risks that can occur. And then it's always up to us, Rebecca, how to manage ourselves, mm-hmm. how to manage our environment, uh, as a means not to harm others, trying to, to complete um, our activities. Sometimes we, we accuse regulators, such as they have the magical powers of profits to, to see what's coming ahead. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, why you did in that? And then if somebody is very preventative, mm-hmm. we accuse them of investing our resources in something that they are not certain where they will happen in the next five or 10 years. If they don't do that, it happens in five, 10 years, you accuse them of not investing. Yeah, so, yeah, they're sort of damned if they do, damned if they don't. It's, they're always wrong. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's it's, it's a tough gig. <laughs> do, yeah. do you think a, um, a vaccine mandate, for example, because that's been, you know, big in the news at the moment, is related to occupational health and safety? Well, public health and health and safety are highly interrelated because the same people yeah. <laughs> they live their lives outside the work environment and they bring with them everything from outside and vice versa. They bring things from inside to, uh, let's say, outside the work environment. Now, the position of many agencies and professionals about the vaccine mandate is that you need to do a proper risk assessment and okay. you need to ensure, first of all, that you have exhausted other options to minimize the risk. Now, if the risk remains considerable and vaccine is the last resort, you might want after consultation with the workforce to suggest it or mandate it. Okay. So it's a matter always of risk. You cannot have a blanket approach. I mean, I think that certain workplaces have more of a, a need for a vaccine mandate, such as like healthcare workers and things like that, because of the way that they're... Yeah, they are. They are exposed and they can transfer to other vulnerable people, yeah, you know, exactly. the virus. And vaccine mandates at the workplace is not new. I mean, why do no, we... No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, why do we get so surprised with the COVID mandates here? And there are plenty of mandates for vaccinations in I think different that there's settings. some, like, propaganda going on that people are like getting so angry and worked up because yeah people don't like to be controlled that's we don't, true yeah okay that's, <laughs> yeah, don't tell want, me what to do yeah yeah we, we need to feel to have those liberties but i think when you by default reject any of those programs initiatives that try to manage a problem holistically it's quite selfish yeah yeah absolutely I didn't visit my parents this year after the borders opened because they are unvaccinated. Yeah. And they told them, I understand, I respect the decision, but I will not be the one who will carry to you any yeah. virus. Of course, you don't want to be responsible having, for Yeah, conscious yeah. problems that I kill them. So I take the system approach. I didn't say, ah, you're not vaccinated. I don't care. I will, you know come yeah. to you and it's your problem. No, the problem of each of us is a problem of others. Yeah, well, I mean, we are, like, our social systems, we are dependent on each other. I think a lot of people ha- can have very individualist mindsets that downplay the impact that we have on one another. If they don't see the immediate effects, they underestimate the risk. Yeah, I, I definitely... Know, health consider. effects, like, we know things that deteriorate health and we still do it and even with the environmental sustainability i'm really still trying to persuade my son we live together yeah don't throw the plastics there put them in the recycling bucket. <laughs> and he's still doing that because some habits are very it's very difficult to break if you're not seeing the effects of your actions then it's sort of like is it really a problem you have to 
you have to do what? You cannot enforce things. I mean, from our roles, we can be the examples. Yeah, yeah, that's, okay? that's definitely a good and approach. You, you hope that the more visible those examples are, not mm-hmm. you know, contained in my home, but they have the same practices and behaviors outside, that more people will say, okay, why is this guy doing that? What's the benefit of, of that? Or just reminding them if they already know the benefit that, ah, yes, yeah. I should do that or, or the other. Yeah. I know that many workers, particularly in more like sort of construction or physical labor roles, can express frustrations at restrictive regulations. How challenging is it to create regulations that are practical for people who are on the ground? 30 years ago, passing a seat belt in your car was mm-hmm. restrictive. People really didn't like it. Yeah, they didn't. That, they I didn't. know there was a lot of resistance. Now it's common practice, although we have only a very few mm-hmm. that see that as a restrictive mechanism. So first of all, the label we put on the regulations matters. When you say restricted, you're already preoccupied. It's yeah. bad. We don't like restrictions. Yeah. When you say enablers to, have to prevent bad things from happening, then they have another meaning okay now regulations are not there to restrict are there to set the boundaries yeah and to propose it's sometimes enforced to be honest uh, measures oh seatbelts are enforced yeah, to, so. to, yeah, yeah to, for, for health and safety and, and other areas of course now in the construction industry, they have the full arrest systems or they need, of course, to, to wear the uh, personal protective equipment and so on. Indeed, there are moments where people feel quite stressed and frustrated. Let's say, imagine you work outdoors 35 degrees mm-hmm. and you need to wear all this protective equipment because the regulation, the policy says so, and you're waiting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the problem is that even if you continue wearing those... You will get so stressed and frustrated that you will not pay attention to something and then you might get injured. Now, here is the risk assessment approach. What could happen if I'm exposed eight hours, let's say, to a dangerous activity and one hour out of the eight, I am exposed in heat, just Mm -hmm. one out of eight. Why not removing the PP but applying other measures to keep the risk low? So we have those approaches in health and safety. The sad thing is that we don't consider them. So we do have rules that might decrease safety in some aspects. So we we change them, but we don't think about. Yeah, we don't think, or let's say we have somebody for an hour. It's not bearable. Good. Have two people for 30 minutes each with the whole protective equipment there. Mm -hmm. Keep them both safe while doing the job. Okay, yeah. let's say the very high level example. So regulations also, as I said before, cannot foresee all circumstances. No, of course not. They yeah. cannot. So we need to put our thinking there. We need to discuss. We need to see what we have, what we know, what could happen and work together to minimize any risks. Bad things will happen because we cannot control everything and we cannot anticipate everything, how things interact sometimes. But this does not mean that the bad thing is acceptable. So I suppose that changing workplace and safety, like getting people to comply, would be more about getting people to change mindsets and behaviours so that they're in the habits of doing things in a safer way. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I don't want people to comply. I want people to appreciate. That's a, a really good way yeah. of, of thinking yeah because when you say compliance the connotation is negative you should comply yeah. it's very like police um, you know regulatory thing to comply with i suppose if you think of them as protections instead of restrictions as yeah, well yeah, like that's, that's these are things before. that are here to, to protect me like i'm glad that they're there i can definitely see that like being glad that a safety rail exists because it's for my safety sometimes we think things will happen to everyone else apart from us um so i think that people the are risk. quite bad at assessing risks um you see that with like gambling and things like that as well that you know people like to gamble they like to you know buy a lotto ticket even though realistically that the chances of them winning a you know a big jackpot are 
quite low, but Gabling, yeah. Rebecca, when you have the knowledge and the information there, is selfish again. Why? Because any adversity that will happen to you will have effects on the system. That's the thing we don't understand. I have a cousin back in mm. Greece, and he was really speeding when uh, riding his motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Say, why are you doing that? You know the danger. Say, it's my life. I yeah. don't care. I, I'm not going to kill somebody. Say, first of all, you don't know whether at the time you will you speed you up and use that. control yeah. that nobody's on your way, on your path. Second, you will damage maybe assets of somebody. Third, if you die, then what are the implications? If you don't die and you remain in, invalid for the rest of your life, what the implications will be for the rest of the system? People have to look after you. Yes, and, yeah, you become... and the health system also is better than everything. So I don't want to, to sound restrictive or theoretical, but when I know that something will probably lead to something negative, yeah. and that I still pursue it, it's selfish. Of course, somebody now in the area of safety and health within business will say have production pressures. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the reality. And this is why occupational health and safety doesn't focus only on what Rebecca and Nectarius do, but they look how the technical system around them might drive those behaviors. So, Rebecca, changing my behavior will not change the system of work. We need to, to look yeah. what drives my behavior. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, for example, you, you might notice that truck drivers drive when they're sleepy and we know that that's an unsafe behavior. But we also need to look at the fact that they're under a lot of pressure to get certain distances and, and travel and get these goods on time to some place yeah. and they might lose their job or income. Their very life depends on their ability to do so. So they take risks that they might not if, you know, that pressure wasn't there. So Yeah, and we forget now, very great example, the role of the consumer, the citizen, who wants everything Everything next now. minute, not yeah. Yeah, no, not <laughs> next day. And they say, ah, the truck drivers, what, uh, what a pity there. Well, we push the system to the boundaries yeah. without the perfection, you know, of deliveries, of services, of products, everything. Back in the Netherlands, that's become really frustrated when the trains are late. Mm -hmm. So I was on the platform with um, a colleague and it was 15 minutes delay. And yeah, he, he had to to be at the meeting on time so he started you know complaining about things ah delays and that's not good to say if we exclude the case that there is an intentional delay which is very rare that somebody says no i'm gonna stay in the, in the plot <laughs> in the previous station i'm not gonna move my train i will wait for 15 minutes <laughs> so, well i haven't come across yet <laughs> such <laughs> such a case so the most probable thing is that there is a maintenance problem, there is a signaling problem, um, there is a driver that feels unwell maybe or whatever. So it's about the safety of the system. So yeah, well, I mean, I've with trains especially, there are so many things that can impact the tracks and cause delays. Like yeah, okay. I, I remember being on a train and it, it stopped and sat still for like a good hour while I was on it and everyone got delayed because of it because somebody had driven their car onto the tracks and it was an accident like we found out later that they'd just accidentally accelerated instead of reverse and just gone boom straight yeah. down onto the tracks yeah. so. <laughs> and, and once more you see that we don't try to understand what happened and led to a situation we complain. We only think about how it affects us. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. All, it's about us. The selfish part, as I said before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was another example, um, flying from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam to London. And after a two hours delay, because there was a maintenance problem with the aircraft, they say, guys, flight is cancelled. And everyone got crazy. Well, I thank God that the maintenance problem was not discovered on there. Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that this whatever leakage, I don't know what uh, broken component, <laughs> whatever happened there, you should think that you're still on ground, safe, and the business did not take any unreasonable risk to fly mm -hmm. people while their was not fully airworthy. So 
what is the role of the citizen in sustainability, in health and safety, in whatever happens? How do we affect the system? We always complain about the system affecting us. That's true. But what yeah. is our role? In but we create the system. So we, we need to like, if, if we've identified that there are aspects of the system or multiple systems that are, you know, negatively impacting people, we need to think about how we can change them and improve them. I know that, for example, people who are upset about trains being late, part of that's probably just being impatient and, and selfish, that's true, but part of that might be concerned that they're going to be late for work or, you know, missed productivity and, and it's similar kind of pressures that are just sort of still there. Yes, but sometimes those pressures yeah, exist, but we overestimate them. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Imagine what would an employer do if you say, you know, you call, I will be an hour too late because we have um, the delay, have no other means to, to get to work. Will mm-hmm. the employer fire you? Because. I mean, I think that, that really depends on the workplace because some places would. What do you think? <laughs> most think of the places would not. Most, most places, yeah, you're going to have people not. who are understanding. And um, if the employer fires you because of this reason it was time to leave the company yeah (laughs) (laughs) i mean employer or business stand being having that kind of like restricted rigid thinking is going to harm your business long term as well so it's bad from their perspective you will you will probably lose a skilled you know knowledgeable experience working because it happened that was delayed yeah, well, I mean, you're being I mean, inflexible no. and, and having unreasonable demands. So I think yeah, pressures exist, but sometimes we put those pressures more uh, on ourselves than they really exist out there. Yeah. So what? Somebody was late. I mean, only I can imagine if I were a doctor uh, rushing to save a patient, yes, yeah. then this delay could be, you know, detrimental. Yeah. This doesn't happen really uh, I don't think frequently. And they mm, wouldn't take public They wouldn't be taking the, the train, probably, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, just, you know, imagining um, a situation. Systems thinking by feeling part of the system, but realizing that we are part of the system. Yeah. Not just pointing the finger to other people what you do and what you do not do, but yes, look for behaviors, look for things that do not look right, Uh, advise people but our example is what can change I suppose it's about expanding your perception of things to not just be so narrowly focused on your own personal experience as well like you're not a protagonist in a in a story or a movie you're part of a, a world full of people who are all equal to you you know and they have their own experiences and each one of us Rebecca feels the center of the world yeah <laughs> everything works for Nectarius and Rebecca you know. <laughs> uh, it's okay I mean I don't say that we do not take care of course of ourselves and feel some pride sometimes and do some you know extra <laughs> things for ourselves but not only that that's that's my message here of course yeah it, to- it's sort of about like when you're on a on a plane and you know they, they tell you to put the oxygen masks on yourself before anyone next to you so yeah you do have yeah, to yeah, take care yeah. of yourself first yes. that doesn't mean that you only take care of yourself <laughs> that's <laughs> so. true and the connections you know going back to the safety and sustainability we have practices now sustainable practices that contribute to health and safety so because i i brought up only examples like aviation fuels and wind farm that we haven't really uh check the benefits uh, so we have electric vehicles, okay? So those actually now that produce no fumes for mm-hmm. the workplace or they can produce less heat in the workplace or they don't accelerate with the same force and speed like the conventional vehicles, decrease health and safety risks at the workplace. So at the same oh, time, really you, ha- you have the environment. Yeah. At the same time. So they don't have to compete always. We need to find where we can be find solutions that are yeah. working for everyone and yeah. yeah exactly that's what we should always I think be trying to achieve so I think that 
uh, we will end it there because we're about yeah. time. Oh. Thank you so much for talking with me today. It's it's a real pleasure to talk to you. And... I enjoyed it very much, well, <laughs> Rebecca. Thank you very much. And That's Maury, great. thanks very much for being in the background. And um... Yes, thank you, Morris, <laughs> for hosting and recording. <laughs> yes, I'm here, by the way. Thanks for that. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Have a nice evening. Thank you so much.